Wow. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, and I also want to thank um, all of the uh, sponsors of, of this talk, um, which include uh, Dr. Donald Carter, who's the Chief Diversity Officer, as you know, uh, the Rainbow Alliance, and, uh, you know, through Ahmed, uh, the Mozolo Center here. So I really uh, want to say thank you, and I'm just really, really uh, excited to, to be here today. So as you know, um, the title of this talk is, um, Is Gay the New Black? And um, that might have been the first thing that interested some of you. Like, oh, damn, what is he going to talk about? Uh, <laughs> sounds a little incendiary. Um, that's how I like it. So, um, <laughs> uh, and we'll get into, into that. Some of you may be familiar with where that phrase comes from. And uh, uh, we'll talk about, talk about that here in this talk. Um, so... Over the last three years, the LGBT community has been abuzz with this phrase, right, that gay is the new black, right? How many people have seen that different places or have heard that recent, you know, in the last several years, right? Some, some folks have heard that. Um, the phrase popped up on T-shirts and on websites. The Advocate, um, which if you don't know, is a national sort of, you know, LGBT uh, magazine um, and, and website, um, the cover of the advocate from the November 2000 from November 2008 used the phrase um, to talk about the tensions between African Americans and the LGBT community. The idea that gay is the new black, while not new, um, exploded in the mainstream, as I said, in 2008, <laughs> largely due to the simultaneous and historic election of our first black president, Barack Obama, and the passage of Proposition 8 in California which reneged on a court decision the previous spring that allowed for gay and lesbian couples to marry in the state. So part of what, you know, this idea that gay is the new black, what, it, what it's sort of doing as a phrase, like the political work it's doing as a slogan, um, is to imply that the current lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement for equality in civil law is not only tantamount to the racial justice claims of blacks, um, and largely represented by the 1960s civil rights movement as we think about it, right? That's usually the kind of the comparison that it's drawing from. Uh, but in fact, um, and this is, you know, whatever, my argument, um, but in fact, gay or lesbian identity in and of itself, um, oh wait, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, so, so as I said, you know, gay is a new black implies that the current lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement for equality in civil law is not only tantamount to racial justice claims of blacks, you know, again, represented by the civil rights movement, but in fact, gay or lesbian identity in and of itself has become the new barometer for oppression and equality, right? So that's part of what the phrase is, is the political work that that, that slogan is trying to, to do and the assumption that it's making. So to say that another way, um, it's suggesting that race is no longer the, the predetermining factor uh, for suffering or oppression, but rather sexual orientation and to a lesser extent gender identity um, as represented by the main policy issues the movement is attempting to advance. You know, I mentioned in the beginning marriage equality, you know, ending the don't ask, don't tell policy, uh, which happened. Uh, the James Byrd, Matthew Shepard James Byrd Act, which was the hate crimes legislation that passed um, uh, in 2009, and then sort of finally, you know, and, you know, trailing off the Employee Non-Discrimination Act, right? <laughs> the, the, the last thing that uh, many of the kind of equality organizations are concerned about, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but is gay, in fact, the new black, or is this political deceit? <coughs> What are the roots of these tensions between racial justice, especially vis-a-vis -vis blacks and the LGBT mainstream movement, and how are the two markedly different? How can we better understand a racial justice agenda in the United States that can have at the same time a perspective, analysis, and agenda that includes justice for LGBTQ people? I would argue that the, that while I would argue that the that while homophobia still clearly exists and we have a long way to go to ending it. Gay is not the new black. Old black is the new black. And if the mainstream LGBT movement 
were really interested in racial justice, the strategy and the very policy agenda itself would be radically transformed and could not rest on the agenda as it currently exists. So to go back and talk about um, the, you know, kind of what happened in 2008. So on the night of November 5th, um, or that was the, the morning after, but many people in America were shocked and amazed at the election of our nation's first black president, and by a fairly substantial margin in states and in territories long thought lost to the Republican Party. And I guess all that feeling of love and unity had come to a screeching halt almost as soon as it began, as the electorate in California also voted to end a Supreme Court decision just months before that allowed for same-sex couples to marry in the state. But not only did Proposition 8 pass, um, but according to the first exit polling data that was released, that some of you may know about, um, that original exit polling data suggested that 70% of black people in the state of California voted for Prop 8. We'll get into that <laughs> later. Um, many in the white LGBT community felt an enormous sense of betrayal. How could black people betray the legacy of civil rights for which they fought so hard in the 1960s? And how could they, at the same time that we, as the kind of white gay community, you know, we did our civic duty and turned out to vote for Barack Obama? Right, so I always tell the story. I got into a huge fight that Wednesday morning with a old friend of mine, white gay man, on Facebook, right? One of those Facebook views. That you to, if you're Facebook friends with me already or you, you know, do that later, yeah, you'll see all kinds of, you know, fights with people. I love to argue. Um, so, <laughs> um, anyway, so, so he posted something, so I, I think I posted something that said, like, oh, you know, I am really not looking forward to all these white gays crying and hollering and screaming about Proposition 8, like, for the next couple of weeks and blaming black people for it. <laughs> so then, so, like, people start posting. So my friend posts and says, um, well, he said something to the effect of, like, well, you know, Kenyon, you know, we you know, we turned out, like the, you know, gay community, white gay community, we turned out and voted for Barack Obama, and I was really excited and whatever, you know, um, but, you know, I don't feel like the, you know, love was really there from the black community, so on and so forth, right? And I remember we got into this whole thing, I remember saying to him, because he was going on about how we, we did you a favor by voting for Barack Obama. And I said, well, who did you do a favor to? First of all, I was like, and secondly, like, you're saying to me that voting for John McCain and Sarah Palin was an option for you, which says something to me <laughs> more about you than it does about Barack Obama, Prop 8, or any of that. So, anyway. <laughs> um... <laughs> So that's what, you know, that's what kind of was going on, right? Three years, these were the kinds of conversations that were happening. And, um, you know, so the, the sort of fallout from all of that most famously was uh, white gay sex columnist Dan Savage, who wrote, um, you know, on that morning of November 5th in a, a Seattle Post intelligence or blog site they have called The Slog, a blog post called Black Homophobia, right? And so I'm going to read the entire post. It's short, but it's, it's just too much to, to skim. So I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, so this is Dan Savage, um, the morning after Prop 8 passes. African American voters in California voted overwhelmingly for Prop 8, writing anti-discrimination into California's constitution and banning same-sex marriage in that state. 70% of African American voters approved Prop 8, according to exit polls, according to 53% of Latino voters, 49% of white voters, and 49% of Asian voters. More Dan Savage. I'm not sure what to do with this. I'm thrilled that we've just elected our first African American president. I wept last night. I wept reading the papers this morning. But I couldn't, but I can't help but feeling hurt that the love and support aren't mutual. I know this, though. I'm done pretending that the handful of racist white gay men out there, and they're out there, and I think that they're scum, are a bigger problem for African Americans, gay and straight, than the huge numbers of homophobic African Americans are for gay Americans, whatever their color. This will get my name scratched off the invite list of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which is famous for its anti-racist training seminars, but whatever. Now, um, as
as a side note, um, I have been a trainer at those very uh, anti-racist seminars uh, at Creating Change that he's referring to, just for full disclosure. And I'm not, you know, just, you know, talking smack about him because of that. Um, <laughs> as I will in a second, but I just thought I'd, <laughs> but I just thought I'd let you know that fact. Um, you know. Uh, so anyway, so then he finishes by saying, um, finally, I'm searching for some exit poll data from California. I'll eat my shorts if gay and lesbian voters went for McCain at anything approaching the rate that black voters went for Prop 8. Right? So that's, that's the end of the quote. So um, Savage's post, again, was indicative of the mood among a kind of, oh, I would argue, sort of a lot of white gay men in particular. Um, you know, and, and as I said before, you know, I got into a huge fight with my friend in the morning after that was kind of one of those sort of moments expressing that kind of, like, you know, white gay outrage around, you know, Prop 8. So it was from that moment that the catchphrase, gay is the new black, became somewhat of a rallying cry by uh, white LGBT activists to suggest that discrimination against LGBT people in the United States is the new marker of total social injustices and race was no longer important. And Savage's sentiments are pretty indicative of uh, this sense of sacrifices for blacks that white gay community felt like it has made for, for black folks. Um, but here's some sort of reality to that, right? Um, and I've sent this, what I'm about to say, I, I remember when this came out, I posted it to my friend's uh, Facebook page, you know, and was like, take that. <laughs> so here's just some truth about the actual moment. So um, the polling data from 2008 proves otherwise, right? So according to a political website um, called 538.com, um, so here's what they did when they looked at some of the exit polling data. Um, specifically looking at, at kind of the gay voters. Comparing exit polls from 2004 and 2008 makes the breadth of Barack Obama's victory clear. Obama received a larger share of the vote than Kerry among voters of all genders, races, education le levels, and income classes, and virtually all religions. The only groups uh, with whom he underperformed Kerry were people uh, over the age of 65 and gay and lesbian voters. Right? So that says something about, you know, this sort of notion that, oh, the gays, you know, really went out there and uh, supported Obama in droves. Um, it actually uh, doesn't prove to be uh, true um, in that respect. So, um, you know, but it didn't end there, right? On November 16th, um, again, as I said in the beginning, The Advocate published the cover story with the title, Gay is the New Black, and even Tyra Banks on her now canceled <laughs> talk show, um, you know, had a show that was called Gay the New Black, right? So this was the, the whole thing. Um, but as I stated in, in the opening, the assumption that LGBT people, despite their race, class, or income, are one and the same and suffer the same discriminations that can be addressed by the national LGBT agenda as it currently exists it's not only a deceptive and shallow read of what discrimination and oppression exists for people of color, including LGBT people of color in the United States. It also fails to address some of the real problems in LGBT advocacy that happen specific to Prop 8 in California and in virtually all other statewide battles for marriage equality, and that have far less to do with how black people voted in the California election. So just to also let you know um, the truth about the exit polling data from California. So um, a couple months later, I think in December, actually not even two months, uh, about a month later in December, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force released a, a report looking um, more closely at the exit polling data from California. And it showed that not 70%, but about 57% of black voters voted for Prop 8 in, in the state of California. Right, so the whole presumption was wrong, and even after that that report was released, and you know a lot of the queerty and a lot of the sort of gay blogs, you know, wrote about it. If you read the comments on any of those posts, like this is white gays who just don't believe it. Like they just don't, they just refuse to believe it. I mean, people say like I don't believe that data. I believe black people are really homophobic, and that is what it is. Um, and the, the sort of second piece to to that to also consider is that. Um, well, I'll get, I'll get into that later. I'll move. What I'll talk about now specifically is, you know, the Prop, of, Prop 8 campaign itself and, and what some of the problems were. 
One of the things to kind of consider, um, you know, if uh, those of you who are, I don't even think you have to be interested in kind of policy or doing activism or advocacy in that way, but just to kind of understand what's happening when you see stories in the news about like legislation, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level, city level or whatever, like how things are getting passed and what, like how things, you know, even kind of make it to, um, you know, whether it's the ballot initiatives that happen in different states or the floor of legislatures. Um, and we can talk maybe later more specifically about like same-sex marriage passing in New York State, right, and how that happened. But it's sort of important to know sort of what's behind the story than just the, the kind of legislation itself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the campaign, you know, sort of for and against Prop 8's passage and what, what actually happened on the ground, um, you know, as a way to kind of tease out some of these issues around, around race and kind of who caught the blame, you know, in that moment. Um, so here's what happened. So on May 15th, the California Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional in the state to prevent same-sex couples from getting marriage licenses, right? It's May 15, 2008. Uh, so in the state of California, anyone with enough signatures that can virtually, that can put virtually, anybody with enough si signatures can put virtually anything to a public vote. And so money poured in from conservative groups. The Church of Latter-day Saints was a major player in terms of fundraising um, to revoke the Supreme Court decision in the state of California by getting enough signatures first of people saying that they want a state referendum on, you know, same-sex marriage, um, you know, and that's sort of how Prop 8 ended up on the books, amongst a number of others. This happens in California and a handful of other states all the time uh, that, that have this, this sort of initiative. Um, so um, what ended up happening, once the money was on the ground to get a ballot initiative together um, and they turned in the signatures, you know, to the state, then that became Proposition 8, right, which was written to essentially revoke the Supreme Court decision in the state of California and add a constitutional amendment to define marriages between a man and a woman, right? Um, so most people think that the LGBT organizations and allies represented by what became the No on Eight campaign, right? So the No on Eight was the conglomeration of organizations that, you know, were fighting uh, Proposition 8 from being passed, and the Yes on Eight were the people who wanted it to pass. Um, so most people think that, you know, the No on Eight campaign was outspent by the Yes on, uh, yes on Eight campaign, and that's not true. Uh, the groups trying to prevent Prop 8 from passing the No on 8 people uh, raised $43 million as compared to nearly $40 million raised by those who wanted to pass the measure, right? So the gays had a little bit more money, right? But about evenly matched. Um, but as reported, as was reported by Rolling Stone magazine and several other publications after all of this happened, one of the main issues was a poorly conceived strategy by the No on 8 campaign which included an over-reliance on a media campaign, a serious disregard for uh, grassroots organizing, um, among some other things, which all of which the Yes on 8 campaign had. Now, I happened to be in San Francisco at a summit of LGBT leaders working on family policy issues the week after the election, like so probably like around the 10th. Uh, of November, I was in, in San Francisco, um, so it was still really raw. There were still um, uh, uh, demonstrations out, for, you know, in San Francisco and Sacramento and all the cities around the state of California, you know, after that. And while the kind of group of folks who were there at this meeting, you know, were all over the map politically about whether people sort of saw same-sex marriage as the issue we should be fighting for, whether people saw it as like you know, an essential right. Um, but one of the things that, like, unanimous among the uh, folks from California who had been in the state doing that work um, was that they were completely <laughs> livid at all of the different ways that the campaign had been run. Several of them expressed the way um, the campaign hired political assault consultants, mostly from outside of the state, um, and those consultants dismissed them and did not take their help when they offered, right, which included um, several things. Like, so I met, like, um, 
white gay couple who has kids who are at this meeting who, you know, they went to the No on Eight people and said, you know, we will, you know, go in front of the media, we will hand out flyers to our neighbors, we'll do all this work to talk about, like, what this means to our family, right? Like, we have kids, like, blah, blah, blah. This is what this means, and it doesn't mean they were completely just, like, ignored. Um, and some of the other offers that came in were from several um, LGBT people of color organizations who agreed to organize in their communities to translate materials into Spanish or Mandarin or other languages, um, or to have, again, their families used as public figures to speak out about issues of importance. Um, but again, they were mostly not used or were given too little resources. Um, and so what the campaign did was, this is a campaign kind of strategy that they use out of a box. If you look at what happened in California, what's happened in Arizona, what's happened in South Carolina, what's, what's South Carolina was a little bit different. Um, they, I give them a lot of credit. But um, a bunch of other states where there was some kind of legislative move to, whether either through a ballot initiative or... Um, otherwise, just through the sort of legislature to kind of move a constitutional ban on same-sex marriage, the LGBT groups and their advocates have responded with the same kind of campaign out of a box, right? Um, and so I'm going to describe what that looks like. So the campaign strategy is always to focus on the movable middle, right? So the movable middle is usually defined in terms of like political electoral strategy terms as the group of people uh, they pay a lot of people to do a lot of polls. Now, I don't know who the hell they call, because I've never gotten the call to ask me my opinion about a damn thing, right? Other than, you know, your student loans are late, now you're going to pay that. <laughs> Beyond that, I never get asked my opinion about stuff. Um, so, they, you know, so these polls just call um, people and pull them on issues of the day, so on and so forth, and then they sell that information to advocacy groups, left, right, or in the middle, whatever, um, you know, to give them a, a sense of that data, right, and on how they should kind of strategize on how to move an issue, right? So um, that movable middle, you know, are people who they think can be swayed, you know, people who are maybe in, not totally in their camp, people who maybe could be moved on the issue or not just like totally hostile, right? And so when they focus on the movable middle, then they come up with a campaign strategy that they think will speak to that group of people, right? Um, and so what they have done in every single state, in every single campaign, like I said, save maybe South Carolina um, as maybe one exception. Florida is doing some different things now as well. But basically what they've decided to, what they always decide to do is don't talk about race, don't talk about religion, and don't talk about sex or any kind of LGBT family structure, what have you. And so, um, right, which seems counterintuitive, right? Like, first of all, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you just, it, first, especially on the sex thing, because that's where people are hung up, on the sex that they imagine us to be having, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's, and so not to directly go there and just have a, that where you can strategically just talk about it instead of trying to avoid it. But that's sort of what they do. And religion, right? They, they avoid all of those um, issues on, intentionally and their strategy. And so for California with the Prop 8 issue, the strategy was to target, they figured out that their quote unquote movable middle were middle class white women voters largely in Southern California, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where the money went, right, um, for the campaign. And so once it became clear, right, so we're talking, right, this is summertime, right, um, and both this, you know, now, uh, you know, Barack Obama, you know, receives the nomination, and it becomes clear that then black voters are going to turn out in large droves in this, you know, across the country. Um, then there was a concern that a large black voter turnout would spell doom for the proponents of Prop 8, right? Um, and, and, I, and I, in fact, uh, you know, have heard that um, there was even some discussions about do we figure out ways to suppress black votes in the state of California? With voter suppression, this is half the game, right? You know, don't get it twisted, right? Half the game, um, usually from the re Republicans, right, is how to, like, you know, keep people from voting with these voter fraud <coughs> foolish conversations, right? It's, you know, uh, a joke. 
but um, and a whole range of other things we can talk about later. But that was that was some behind the door conversation um, that happened. In addition to that, um, the campaign, the No on Eight campaign, did not hire a person to target like an organizer to target the black community in California until seven days before the election, right? Um, and there were several black organizations in California, including in the meantime in, in, in LA, and they will talk to you at nauseam about how pissed they were about how this went down. They were not given any money, no help, didn't ask. Um, that's a, it's a black gay organization. Uh, we're not asked their opinion about what should happen in you know Southern California where they you know um, are operate so on and so forth. So that was the the issue. Um, so the other thing was I don't know if you saw this, but you know so when they finally hired Andrew Shorter, who I know is now a staff person at Equality California, she was the, the black person they hired to target the African American community seven days before. Then they put together this, um, like, video, this sort of uh, public service announcement that played on radio, and it was also like a commercial, like a video version. That's, it might still be on YouTube. And Samuel L. Jackson is doing the voiceover for it. And it's this really bizarre, like, nebulous, unclear conversation about we shouldn't be blocking other people for their rights because of the civil rights movement, blah, blah, blah. And only if you have some kind of knowledge about what he's talking about, you, then you have some idea that this is, oh, this is supposed to be about, like, why black folks shouldn't vote, you know, for Prop 8. But it's really nebulous and unclear because, as I said before, like, they don't, like, their strategy is to really not ever talk about race at all. But they sort of had to, um, you know, in that moment. Although they always capitulate to some kind of reference to the civil rights movement when it's convenient for them. But that's a whole other story, right? They don't ever really deal, like, kind of square with issues of racial justice. So, again, if the strategy was to spend all the resources on middle-class uh, white women voters, is it shocking to assume that the majority of blacks vote, would vote for Prop 8? Um, Secondly, um, black voters, or let me say, black folks only represent 7% of the entire state of California, right? We are in, what, L.A., Oakland, Sacramento, like a couple of places, right? <laughs> Some of San Diego, right? Only 7% of the state's entire population and only 10% of the entire electorate that year, right, or that election cycle. So black people actually in actual numbers, if all of us had voted one way or the other, just are not enough in number in California to have changed that vote one way or the other. So as I said before, the other issue was that the 70% uh, number was was in fact incorrect, and it was only about 57, 58 percent of black voters voted for the measure, which was only slightly higher than other racial categories. Now, I don't want to suggest that anybody would have should have voted for Prop 8, but the idea that black people voted en masse to pass the measure is untrue. And actually, the largest voting constituencies that helped the measure pass when you parse the, the exit poll dating were people... Um, basically senior citizens, and um, people who consider themselves like of faith, right? So since age and religion were the two largest factors, why was there not similar amounts of outrage as senior citizens or Christians, right? Instead, there were several reports of African Americans in California being called the N-word or physically assaulted even, um, you know, by pres white, presumably LGBT folks in the wake of Prop 8's passage, right? Um, and I was hearing some of those that week after when I was in California. Um, so the passage of Prop 8 then gave rise to the gay is the new black idea and continued to, um, and continued the already existing notion that gays and lesbians, regardless of social class or access to resources, are in fact the new second class citizens, right? We hear that like a lot. So just to talk about second class citizenship for a brief moment, um, whether or not you're a proponent of same-sex marriage or not, it's, you know, not the point here. Well, not the point right now, but um, <laughs> in this particular point of the argument. Um, so just, but let's be clear, right? Prop 8 is not the Dred Scott decision, right? <laughs> um, so if you're unfamiliar with the Dred Scott decision, um, in 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court decided in Scott versus Sanford that... Um, 
and I quote that people of Afri- the people of, that people of African descent imported into the United States and held as slaves or their descendants, whether or not they are slaves, or not protected by the Constitution and basically could never be U.S. citizens. Um, the court also held that the U.S. Congress had no authority to prohibit slavery in federal territories, um, and that because slaves were not citizens, they could not sue in court. Right? Now, while there is clear discrimination against LGBT people enshrined into law, and at various <laughs> times and circumstances you know, throughout history, um, you know, there are different sort of more progressive, more kind of conservative societies or just, you know, times, you know, where, um, you know, gay sexual activity, uh, you know, or gender notions or behavior um, become heavily police controlled and sometimes criminalized. But that, you know, is very different than saying that it has the same precedent that rules people, that the, that the same president that rules people with same-sex desire um, as non-citizens, unable to even petition the U.S. Judicial, judicial, judicial system for any form of redress, right? It's very different legal framework, um, you know, between criminalizing sexuality or gender identity and saying that you're, like, not a citizen at all, right? Um, in fact, the now infamous decision, you know, uh, the Dress Scott decision delivered by Chief Justice uh, Taney at the time, uh, you know, claimed that the founders of the U.S. Constitution had viewed blacks, and this is a quote, uh, beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the right white race, whether in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. 150 years later, the Dred Scott decision has never been overturned, actually. Um, and although the 14th Amendment, which gave uh, citizenship to all people uh, born in the United States, including the descendants of chattel slaves, um, you know, uh, the next 100 years of Jim Crowism in Southern laws and policy in the Northern states largely held that decision in, in actual fact, right? Um, People may feel that comparing the Dred Scott decision is unfair, right, to gay marriage. Um, but that is entirely how many black people feel when the second-class citizenship sort of rhetoric is invoked by a mostly wealthy white elite group of gays and lesbians when the question of marriage is raised or when the civil rights movement of the 1960s is used, which most black folks see as a very specific social movement to basically undo the legal precedent the Dred Scott decision and later Plessy v. Ferguson set forth, right? People, you know, historians, um, you know, sometimes refer to what we call the civil rights movement colloquially as the second reconstruction, right? Because it was really what was supposed to happen in 1865, but was really undone by time Rutherford B. Hayes became president in 1876, right? Um, and it was another hundred years later. Uh, in some respects, I'm done. That's another talk. Uh, <laughs> but if we turn back to Prop 8, the feeling that among many same-sex marriage advocates was expressed in ways that suggested that the election of a black president meant that calls by people of color for racial justice were in fact passe, and that the passage of Prop 8 meant that the last horizon of civil... Uh, meant meant that, you know, sort of marriage was the last horizon of civil rights in American society. And just as a side note, I'm also going to say, I've, since writing this, some just new thinking in ways that I kind of see, uh, you know, kind of LGBT rights, legal rights, right, um, being used not only in the U.S. and kind of Europe as, and, as a, and even in South Africa to some extent, as a way to, as a sort of litmus test for what it means to be a sort of 21st century liberal democracy, right? Despite whatever's actually happening on the ground. And then it becomes this sort of punishing tool for countries that don't, for various reasons, like have decriminal, haven't decriminalized, you know, homosexuality or what have you. Um, and it's not to support that, but, but, but there is this um, kind of uh, way that I feel like it's being wielded to kind of let certain countries into what's seen as sort of like appropriate 21st century democracies, despite a, a range of different violences and genocide, a range of things that are happening in countries um, and disparities. Um, but that's another paper I'm thinking about. Um, so, um, but, you know, just want to note that. 
Um, and so while Prop 8 made it impossible for same-sex couples to get marriage licenses from the state of California, and is therefore definitely discriminatory, there were no actual real loss of material rights for same-sex couples, and I blogged about this, um, you know, in, in 2008. Um, uh, and this is a, kind of a quote from my blog. So California already had a domestic partnership law on the books, which was signed into law in 2003 and took effect in 2005. So according to the California Domestic Partnership Law, this is a quote from the law, a registered domestic partner shall have the same rights, protections, and benefits, and shall be subject to the same responsibilities, obligations, and duties under law, whether they derive from statutes, administrative regulations, court rules, government policies, common law, or any other provisions or sources of law as are guaranteed to and imposed upon spouses. So in essence, the benefits of a domestic partnership are very similar to those given under civil marriage, um, which are pretty similar to straight married couples, with the exception of the federal recognition to get the different benefits under federal law. The U.S. government does not currently honor state marriages of gay couples. Um, did the California Supreme Court decision, which led to default legal marriage for same-sex couples, in domestic partner benefits already afforded to under the 2003 law? No, right? So the website on the state of California actually had a, a piece under it that said, you know, like, you know, at, on the kind of frequently asked questions, so can we still get a domestic partnership even though there's, you know, same-sex marriage in the state? And so the website said that the court's decision regarding same-sex marriages did not invalidate or change any of the family code statutes relating to registered domestic partners. <coughs> Until a notice of termination is filed with our office, a registered domestic partnership will remain active on California's domestic partnership registry. This office will continue to process declarations of domestic partnership, notices of termination of domestic partnership, and other related filings as permitted by the domestic partnership law. So that would mean that same-sex couples could still get the domestic partnership benefits even though there is now a, sim a ban on civil marriage per se. And so is there a qualitative difference between domestic partner benefits and marriage if neither are recognized federally? They're, they're not. They're, they're the same thing, right? The issue is that is because of DOMA, on, on the Defense of Marriage Act on the federal books, that really a domestic partnership or civil union in, in legal fact is the same thing as a marriage at most, you know, in the state of California, certainly, right? So the idea, so that is to say the idea that Prop 8 represented some massive loss of rights, right, a, a la the Dred Scott decision, is just not true, right? But marriage equality, um, oh, so anyway, um, so not only were there complicated reasons for the passing of Prop 8, which had nothing to do with blacks or other people of color, but Prop 8 itself does not represent, again, the same legal or political trajectory that same-sex marriage advocates would like to lay claim to with African Americans. But marriage equality is best exemplified by the No on Eight Proposition Eight campaign. It's not the only place in which gay identity alone does not trump race. Recent data collected by the Williams Institute in 2008 shows the centrality of race, gender, and urban-rural divides in the material conditions of the so-called like LGBT community. Um, well, this report focused more on lesbian, gay, bisexual households. Um, and just some data real quick from that study. While white gay men and same-sex couples have poverty rates of 2.7% compared to 4.5% of Asian or Pacific Islander, 14.4% of black, and 19.1% of Native American gay men. While just under 6% of non-Hispanic lesbians are poor, that rate is more than tripled for Hispanic lesbians and couples. Within um, lesbian, gay, bisexual households, African American people and same sex couples are much more likely to be poor than white same sex couples. Um, African Americans uh, and same sex couples have significantly higher poverty rates than black heterosexual couples and are roughly three times higher than those of white people and same sex couples. Um, black female household, black female same sex couples report a median income of $21,000 less than white female same sex couples while black male couples report a median income of $23,000 less than white male same-sex couples. Lesbian and gay same-sex individuals and couples are more likely to receive uh, government cash support for low, uh, poor and low-income families and heterosexual people, so, you know, welfare, social security, food stamps, you know, so on, Medicaid, so on and so forth. 
gay male couple poverty rates only become higher than married heterosexual couples if the same-sex male couple includes a black partner, an unemployed partner, or those with children under the age of 18, right? So, um, according to the data, two, a white gay male household earns more money than even a, stri a straight white household. Why? Because of sexism, right? Women earn less on a dollar. So two straight white, so two white men in the household are, generally speaking, going to uh, have earn more income, right, um, than than everybody else, right? Um, so what's most unfortunate is that there are other uh, existing data points that point to the ways in which the LGBT community as a whole suffers disproportionately in healthcare coverage, homelessness. Um, is more likely to be poor than our straight counterparts, um, and yet our national agenda in both its actual policy proposals and the images and media messaging would lead you to believe that most LGBT people are wealthy, white, childless, and with expendable income and live in urban areas, right? Um, and it is this data that, and it is this agenda rather that has to be changed. People of color, the poor, many transgender people who are, um, and people who are undocumented don't benefit or stand to lose from the current agenda, which has no racial or economic justice lens to speak of. So I'm going to talk about each of those sort of issue areas, right, marriage equality, don't ask, don't tell, and kind of put a kind of race and class spin on it to kind of, you know, hopefully help us maybe think about those uh, as not policies that are uh, kind of uniformly uh, beneficial to all LGBT folks. So same-sex marriage advocates often use the reason to fight for marriage equality uh, to be, you know, so that gay and lesbian couples can gain access to the, what is it, thousand and some odd benefits that married people get under the law to help LGBT people to better protect themselves and their households financially. Um, and it's interesting because that's actually, in many ways, the same rhetoric that you know, conservatives and some liberals, in fact, um, use to defend cuts in, med in welfare and Medicaid spending for poor women and to increase marriage promotion among the poor, right? Um, so it's this idea that, like, oh, if people just got married, like, you know, all would be well. There would be, you know, either two, two incomes together and people, you know, wouldn't need, you know, to be draining the taxpayers, well, poor people pay taxes, right? Like people on welfare still pay taxes. Um, you know, you walk out your house and you buy something, you pay taxes. Um, so that notion is stupid. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, you know, but that's, the, you know, it's the same sort of rhetoric, right? That it's about, like, so marriage is, is what sort of um, will make um, the will sort of um, make people not wards of the state, right? And and uh, in an economic sense. Um, so if uh, the mainstream LGBT organizations consider like the right wing to be their enemies, why would you adopt the same rhetoric, right, to further your cause? Furthermore, wouldn't a fight for universal health coverage, including ending employer-based health insurance, achieve better goals for LGBT folks? If you're a lesbian working as a cashier with no health coverage, marriage doesn't help you. If your girlfriend is waiting tables at the diner, uh, you will both be married but with no health coverage, and if one of you gets sick and loses a job or incurs hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills you can't pay, the wedding ring would be pawned so you could eat or keep the lights on or a roof over your head anyway. And what happens to people who currently have benefits under domestic partnership with their employers, um, but then the employer decides that you have to marry your partner in order to continue those benefits. What if they don't want to marry? That's what happened in the state of Massachusetts, right? When Massachusetts passed the you know, same-sex marriage law, um, companies like the Boston Globe, Boston College, other ones that had a, a domestic partnership benefit, which often straight people who were you know, not married but living with their partners or whatever could also benefit from, you know, use those benefits to give their health insurance to, to their uh, significant others or what have you, lost because then they were like, oh, well, now we have gay marriage. We only had that for gay people, so if you want, you know, to get your partner health insurance, y'all got to get married, right? Kind of unintended consequences, right, <laughs> of same-sex marriage passage, you know. Um, just saying. 
<laughs> so don't ask, don't tell. Though, you know, it's just, uh, you know, officially this summer, um, I guess. Like, they keep sort of pushing the date back. First, I thought last year, Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended, and then, I don't know, I don't understand all the regulatory stuff that happened, but we know it's over now. Um, uh, and so, though that uh, policy uh, was just dropped, I think it's still worth exploring. The argument has been made to me that the inclusion of LGBT folks in the military is both a racial and economic justice issue, because black women are the most were the group most disproportionately discharged under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, which is true. Um, and since many poor and working class people often use the military as a means of any kind of job security, as the armed forces essentially make up the largest de facto government jobs program in the country, right? So you know, we're arguing right now in Congress about, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, we should be giving tax breaks to the job creators, right? I don't know what that means, but okay. Um, you know, and the government shouldn't be doing that. Well, the you know, military is really the largest you know, uh, employer. And that's often why congressional people don't want to touch it. One, because it's politically dangerous, but also people know in their districts in San Diego, in Savannah, Georgia, in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Oh, well, I know where the military bases are. Fort Worth, Texas. Um, those were, you know, those are thousands of jobs, right? And they don't want that to happen on their dime, whether or not we actually need the military to be the size that it is. Um, you know, but that's, that's part of the issue. Um, but I would actually argue that it is unethical, quite frankly, that war or the specter of it be the place through which LGBT people get to assert its value to the country. And I wish there were a more productive type of U.S. jobs program that poor people had access to. Furthermore, war, as we've seen in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, actually um, promote rape and sexual violence against women, and presumably sometimes men, if we saw this, the Abu Ghraib photos, um, who are seen as the enemy and therefore disposable, and often uh, a sort of nationalist impulse of the nation, which is the case in Iraq currently. So, uh, so the... the let me read this through, and then I'll, I'll try to explain it better. Um, so often the national impulse of a nation um, against imperialism can increase homophobia and violence against queers as a method of nation building, right? So, you know, in, in a situation where people see, say, in the case of Iraq, this is about, you know, the, the kind of Western imperialism, you know, um, co you know, coming to kind of set up the kind of nation state that it wants, you know, against our would kind of unethically start a war based on lies, all of that, right? That's the context in which the Iraq war was started. And so then, you know, um, you can fuel as in the kind of nation rebuilding phase as what's happening in Iraq is the different kinds of, um, some of them different kinds of uh, Islamic sects are fighting for kind of power in the country. Um, that then can become a place where fundamentalism, not just of Islam, but of any sort of religious fundamentalism, then begins to actually target, you know, LGBT people who they see as disposable in the nation-building project, right? So war, so you actually, in the case of war, actually end up promoting homophobia someplace else, right? Um, and my argument to people often about, you know, don't ask, don't tell of the military and gays, like, if you want to support, you know, gays and lesbians, to be able to live in peace and, you know, and in harmony and with equal rights, and you don't support, you know, going to possibly kill or maim or hurt some gays and lesbians someplace else. <laughs> like, it's a pretty simple argument to me. <laughs> so, um, moving on. <clears throat> Hate crimes legislation. Um, as I stated before, um, you know, the Matthew, James, Matthew Shepard James Byrd Act um, passed in 2009, and, um, you know, I think, obviously, that LGBT people here and abroad should be free from violence. But I think that a model that advocates for tough-on-crime approaches, approaches to bias violence does not work to decrease homophobia or transphobia. In fact, sending homophobes to an institution like the U.S. prison system that encourages homophobia seems ludicrous. Furthermore, LGBT advocacy for increasing the use of the prison industrial complex to solve problems flies in the face of real advances made in the last several years by many racial justice advocates who are seeking to decrease massive imprisonment of black and brown people in the U.S. Um, through ending mandatory minimum sentencing, crack cocaine disparities, and legalization of marijuana. 
And uh, and there are many LGBT folks who are leadership in much of that movement and organization. So the untold story of a lot of you know kind of crim criminal justice reform, prison abolition work in the U.S. A lot of there's a lot of queer people. I used to be one of them, uh, <laughs> working for group, uh, critical resistance. Um, hate crimes laws also ignore racial disparity in sentencing. And the fact that there are LGBT people currently serving time in U.S. prisons who got the better of an attacker but were charged with hate crimes against a straight person, I kid you not. Um, or, uh, you know, it's, yeah, so it's actually true. There are a number of people who are LGBT folks in prison who were attacked first by people. They kicked the person's ass or, you know, they got the better of the attacker and then they end up with the hate crimes charge, right? Um, so the idea, you know, these laws will protect, you know, queer youth of color in places like New York City, you know, where those youth are particularly um, criminalized and surveilled and, and thought of as criminals by the police in many ways. Will those youth be protected, right, under hate crimes laws? Um, again, that we passed, you know, the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Act, which added sexual orientation to federal hate crime statutes. Um, it was also added, how it passed was it was added um, to the Defense Department. Uh, Defense Department budget, you know, when it cleared Congress, a move that was made so that no one would vote it down, right? So it was bundled into the vote for the uh, Defense Department's budget in, in uh, I guess it was in fiscal year 2010 going into. And that's how it passed. Um, but should the LGBT movement feel, how should the LGBT movement feel about attaching this bill to the enormous Defense Department budget at a time when the country is actually calling for full withdrawal for troops from the Middle East and cuts in our overall kind of uh, spending in, in that area. Um, so Employee Non-Discrimination Act. Now while I support the passage of the Employee Non-Discrimination Act, we should also be clear that there are many ways in which queer people are informally discriminated against before getting a job interview. Um, one, we, I, there was just a study that came out like maybe two weeks ago that showed that gay men actually got, if their resumes indicated that they were gay in any way, they were part of an LGBT group uh, or they worked at an LGBT organization, that they were 40% less likely to get called for um, you know, a job um, than the same resume, but that removed any inference to their sexual orientation because of clubs or you know, they were associated with or boards they served on or other places that they had worked that were LGBT specific, right? So it's an informal way discrimination happens before we even talk about filing an, you know, a discrimination case. Similarly, there have been several studies in the last few years showing African Americans in particular with quote-unquote ethnic sounding names having their resumes passed over when tests were done with more European sounding names with the same job history and qualifications. So if you're a black gay man, black gay man named Rashawn Jackson or black transgender woman named Aisha Moore, ends up may not help you if you are, you know, never even called for an interview, right? Where are the LGBT endorsements for increases in the minimum wage or to help unions lobby for the passage of the Employee Free Choice Act, which would allow for um, more people, to allow more people the ability to, to unionize and collectively bargain, which would in turn mean higher wages and benefits, especially in the southern quote unquote right to work states, which really means right to be fired at any point without recourse. Um, is what it should be called, um, which are the same states where it is legal, um, still legal, to discriminate against LGBT people in places of employment. In other words, we need to move beyond the shallow analysis of LGBT rights because, as we see, race, class, gender, immigration status, disability, and the like can all change the material conditions through which you are able to even access some of these supposed quote unquote rights. And some gay persons' rights. May, might also be another gay person's demise, right, if we use the military as an example. Um, so we look at the rhetorical arguments around gay being the new black. We see that the post-Prop 8 hostility that produced it was misplaced at black people who were not to blame for the passage of that legislation, but was really because the campaign was poorly devised and executed. Even then, when examining social and economic factors that would make that would even make the claim that gays are at the bottom of the social, political, or economic ladder, we see race um, in so much as it largely dictates economic and social realities still is a predominant factor in one's material conditions. 
But if we look to a queer agenda that has a racial lens, there are several issues that come to mind um, in possible places of organizing and political alignment um, and not just kind of empty and exploitative rhetoric, right? And I'll just talk about these really quickly and then we can um, have, a, have a conversation. So one, you know, in education, right? So there's been a lot of discussion about bullying in the U.S., about... Um, you know, in the last year, particularly with the, the kind of highly reported uh, LGBT suicides that have taken place. Um, and at the very same time, so like this time, it was like last fall, last year, it was a whole bunch of conversation, not just about the suicides, but also about, you know, kind of education reform and conditions in schools, right? I mean, there's a fight in the, you know, kind of, you know, president's um, uh, jobs bill, which is about kind of constructing new schools, right? So this conversation about what's happening in U.S. education is, is very um, kind of critical in, in these different kind of entry points from different kinds of groups, right? The whole conversation about Rick Perry and whether or not um, undocumented immigrants who were brought, you know, to the U.S. by their parents should be able to get, you know, college for state tuition. So education is a, is a major conversation right now in American politics. Not always, but it is right now. Um, and so, given the kind of LGBT sort of concern around bullying and the conditions of LGBT people in schools, that would make a, a, an actually a, a, a perfect place to actually begin to work with other kinds of organizations doing other kinds of work around education in the U.S., right? That, that is a natural kind of fit in terms of coalition politics. Um, think about housing and homelessness, right? We're also, you know, obviously facing, a, you know, a national foreclosure crisis um, that's been true for many years. Women of color in particular were the most disproportionately impacted by, um, you know, the subprime, you know, predatory mortgage industry. And, um, and at the same time, um, you know, LGBT folks in national data, it's about 25 to like 40 percent, depending on the study. In New York City, it's about a third to half of homeless youth identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, right? That's a crisis, right, by any stretch. Of, and most of them are black or brown, like 85 percent of them. That's a national crisis by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and to not have a movement that talks about homelessness as, a, as, a, as an issue seems absurd to me. Um, and um, particularly, also just to think about the fact that it's not just LGBT youth who are homeless. QEJ, you know, we work specifically in the adult shelter system because there's this sort of notion that, like, once you turn 18, 21, 25, like, you're going to be an MBA student at Harvard if you were homeless. Or, or somehow, you, what, what, and that, it's not that that's not possible for people, but the reality is that being homeless and unstably housed at 16, 17, 18 sets you up to be unstably housed and homeless later in life and, and have other sort of challenges. So, you know, homelessness, right, is a, is a, is a major issue. Um, there's other issues, health care, um, HIV, AIDS, um, you know, policing, prison, and criminalization, you know, and again, jobs and employment that are important. Um, but I will um, maybe have some of those in the Q&A, and um, uh, you can ask me some tough questions uh, as we go forward. So thank you for this portion, and um, stick around. We'll talk. Thank you. I think we'll uh, take a few questions. I just want to set a couple of ground rules. Um, sometimes folks uh, have many questions, and so last time uh, I set the ground rule of one question, and somebody trumped me by asking question 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. Um, so we'll go with one question at a time. If there's more time, uh, I just want to make sure other people get air time as well. So I turn it over to Kenny again. Sure. All righty. Question. I didn't know anything about the statistics, but um, when I got home and I read, you know, 70% of, of African Americans, um, I lived in Southern California for many years. There weren't a lot of people of, of African descent, right? And so I'm thinking, okay, 70% of 7% 
in actual numbers is less than the 49% of white Californians. Um, and so I was getting angry with the way that percentages were used. Right. So, um, so thank you for, for pointing that out. You said that um, Barack Obama underperformed uh, with gays and lesbians. Um, how much of that do you think has to do with the fact that he doesn't have, he doesn't support gay marriage? Well, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think some of it has to do with that, um, but n I mean, none of them do. I mean, I mean that, that I mean that's the that's the game that's played. Hillary Clinton doesn't like it, you know it didn't in that uh, you know uh, despite what any of them personally feel, I mean, that was their kind of political position, um, you know, Democrat or Republican, really. So um, that suggests uh, that that it wasn't just, like, non-support of, especially because, oh, so let me, let me put it to you this way. Um, Kerry didn't support gay marriage in 2004, and I don't think that Al Gore did in 2000, but gay voters voted more for both of those candidates than they did for Barack Obama, right? So, yeah, so that's that. Did they vote for McCain instead? <laughs> <laughs> they voted more for McCain uh, than they did in other other Republican elections in the, the last several years. But some, I, I probably should say, because I feel like at the time when I was researching this, that also when you looked at um, Cal, the state of California, that actually San Francisco, um, that whatever the, the county is, um, had some of the lowest voter turnout. Um, like the voter turnout in San Francisco was actually below what a lot of the rest of the state was, which just would suggest that, you know, so all this outrage, I'm like, well, girls, y'all didn't even turn out in the Castro to vote, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, or whatever, that in the, you know, the city that obviously, you know, has a large LGBT population, that folks didn't really, didn't turn out to vote as, as much as they did in other parts of the state, as in general, right, not just on Prop 8 at all, or, or Prop 8 specifically. I think you already mentioned it when you when you went into the definition of this of, of your talk, but also uh, um, this this whole line is uh, um, the queer, the new the new black. That uh, in a very twisted way, it is also a reinforcement of this power structure to actually to play into that that um, the discrimination of black is something very fundamental. Otherwise, you could not pick up on that. I mean, it goes back to to uh, uh, also um, John Lennon and uh, this famous song, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that is really, it, John Lennon's songs would only wor work if you, well, reinforce that there is some, some, something fundamental, essential of this discrimination, which I can pick up from and um, actually put myself in a better position of being a victim. And I think it's yeah. really important to see this, this, this connection again. It's it's true. There's a. I think that there's a. Um, and folks, are you talking about the the women of the right. N words of the world? The, the, the Don Lennon song. Yeah, I do think that there, there's a, a specific kind of a thing that happens in in the U.S. Um, and and I, I don't think it's entirely tied to the U.S. But I think it, it gets expressed here in particular ways, um, where every every kind of so many different kinds of advocacy campaigns have to reference black people in this weird way, right? So that it, it, they have to kind of orient themselves around either being the new this, right? Or the, and it's always in reference, this is the new civil rights movement, this is the new, and it always, it, it's to reference like, you know, to get very kind of theoretical, like kind of black as like socially dead, right? That like, Blackness only serves as like this kind of touch point for like the most extreme point of like degradation and like violence, right? 
And it's very, I'm very, like, to give names of other kind of people who do this sort of work, um, uh, Jared Sexton, Joy James, uh, Frank Wilderson III, uh, Joao Costas Vargas, these are kind of, these are people who are writing now who I'm, I'm really influenced by their friends for now, who's not writing now, but, you know. Um, but people who kind of were looking at, like, what specifically the way kind of uh, blackness functions kind of in, like, the kind of national imagination, right, um, or the global imagination. And so it often gets, so like these, so whenever I hear this, like, oh, you know, these, even if they don't even say, so sometimes it's like, with, it's the new civil rights movement, or we're, I'm hearing this a lot in the Wall Street protests, which, you know, makes me want to just, you know, go into apoplexy. It's just like, we're the, you know, we're slaves to corporations, right? Well, first of all, <laughs> like, so, yeah, I'm going to go in. So first, <laughs> so first of all, um, it's another way in which, like, the kind of, like, slave is referenced, right, vis-a-vis -vis black that is, like, the kind of lower, this, this kind of position. Um, but it, it also, um, which is ridiculous, right, because it's not the, the, to suffer from a, a various forms of oppression, of exploitation, all those things can exist, but are not the same as like being physical property, right? Uh, with no laws or no nothing that a you know, white man is bound to respect, right? These are the uh, uh, Dred Scott decision, right? We're talking about a very, we're talking about a different sort of like, we're talking something very different. And they constant. And the other reference is as a side note. It's all. It's always this. It's like either reference to like we're slaves to this, or we're being raped. Like why the rape? Like why the, the also the tie to like sexual violence? Like, like that gets invoked in these ways to describe certain kinds of like exploitation and oppression. That I just think is kind of weird and gross. Well, it, it seems to me that uh, we are, you touch on poem that also that in the beginning of this twenty first century that is a that we are living in a new enlightenment period in this way of reinstating civilization and Western modernity. So however, I mean, we might have all of these problems here, but it is very clear that it can only be solved here and that it can only be solved in the background of this Western modernity. That's why we have that, I mean, I think you, you, you talked about Uganda, for example, and to demonize mm -hmm. um, all this uncivilized, this unwestern uh, society. So also we have this big backslash in, in California and we can actually put the blame on, on our uncivilized tribes here. But uh, it is very, very clear that whatever struggle is going on right now, and we see that as this globalized uh, uh, movement, also we could t uh, take a lot of your uh, talking points right to the anti-Islam uh, argument as well, that um, it is a new negotiation of Western modernity, which of course nobody else has to show off for. Yes. Um, so you're talking a lot about things that happened in 2008, and so now we're getting ready for the next presidential election. Is this rhetoric continuing? Like, is this, like, gay is a new black? Is it, is it still being used very much so? Or, like, are, or has the black community responded in any way? Like, no, sorry, you guys aren't, like, in much the same way that you are now. Yeah, well, I, you know, what's, what's interesting is that um, it is still being used in, in ways. Um, I do think that kind of with a lot of the equality organizations, they've become more careful because there was such quick pushback um, from black queer folks in particular, um, you know, about that whole frame. And um, so they're more particular... I think here, in terms of looking at what's happening ahead, uh, either for 2012 or for, because it's unclear kind of what role, you know, same-sex marriage is going to play in the, you know, in the next election, um, for several reasons. Here's what I think is what I think is happening politically. I wrote a piece um, for Alternet, um, maybe three days after the New York State same-sex marriage law passed. You can Google it. I think it's called Same-Sex Marriage in New York, colon, Progressive Victory or GOP Roadmap. And, you know, I think the question I was, I was sort of 
proposing that like something may be happening that changes the way same-sex marriage gets used, right? So um, one is, so you had this situation here in New York State, how this got passed was you had, um, one of the ways it got passed was you had some Republican, some like right-wing, and I'm talking like, you know, I'm not talking like just civil libertarians here. I'm talking like Tea Party funders. I'm talking, you know, some hedge fund managers. I mean, I'm talking about some real, you know, so-and-sos. And, you know, in terms of their politics, who for whatever reason, sometimes personal reasons, some of them had, you know, gay nephews or sons, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, but who decided to, like, go to the four, you know, New York State legislators who were Republicans who could be swayed on the issue and tell them, we're going to put some money behind your next campaign so you don't feel like you are just going out on a limb to vote for, you know, same-sex marriage and then be thrown out of office in two years, you know, and then you have a problem fundraiser. So that was part of what happened, right? Um, and so to me, um, I actually think that for the Republicans... The Republican Party, right, sees that they can't run on this kind of, and they've run on kind of anti-gay stuff in the last 40 years in different iterations, city, state, federal levels. Um, they cannot do that anymore because even when you look at, you know, quote unquote, studies of young people who identify as Republicans or conservatives, many of them support, or there is a growing majority of them that support same-sex marriage, that support gay people being able to serve in the military, blah, blah, blah. Like, those is, like, gay issues. Um, and so the Republican Party knows that they don't have, they have no future base if they continue to run on such kind of vitriotic, homophobic stuff. And they also know that a huge part of the Democrats, particularly Barack Obama's um, kind of fundraising plan is, like, like, wealthy white gay donors, right? And they have some, too. Right. There are some in the Republican Party um, as well. And so I think what, could, what we could see, not next year, but we could see in the future is the Republicans saying, we delivered on gay marriage in New York State, right? And if they try to operationalize that model to other states, it's a tool to, to basically break the Democratic coalition. So then, because quite frankly, there are a lot of gay people, I'll be quite honest, like having run an organization and met, know the sort of donors and foundations, there are some gays who are only Democrats because the Republican Party is so, has been so vitriotically homophobic. Once that shifts politically, they're gone and their money's gone, right? So... Um, so then what, right? And so I think that actually what could happen is the Republicans end up triangulating the issue, which is kind of what they did here in New York. They basically said, you know, the ones who voted for it and these funders were like, gay marriage is a family, marriage is a, is a conservative value, right? Like that's the new talking point around it, the ones who support same-sex marriage. And then they've had written into the legislation stuff, you know, to say that, like, religious institutions don't have to marry people that they don't want to. Well, who does? I mean, no, no religious institution has to marry people they don't want to. That's mm -hmm. utter bullshit, right? Like, that's just some bullshit. Like, <laughs> point blank, period. Lies. <laughs> lies, lies. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's, it's absurd. I mean, they use that rhetoric in California. Oh, you know, oh, we're going we're gonna to make you marry, like, blah, 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 you know, since when? Anyway... Um, but, but if they write that into the legislation moving forward in other states, then they, or if they end up doing that with the federal DOMA, they drop it and then change, do some kind of legal stuff. Um, that then speaks to their kind of Christian conservative base to say, you know, see, we're protecting you so that you don't have to shift your kind of religious values, right? We're making sure that the law says that you don't, your churches and whatever don't have to marry or accept gay people, whatever. I think that's going to be their strategy in the next five, ten years. And most people think I'm cray cray. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you mark my words. Um, <laughs> I really do. And in fact, um, just a couple months, like, no, not even a couple, a couple weeks ago, several gay funders, uh, Tim Gill, who runs the Gill Foundation, one of the biggest LGBT funders in the country, um, and then the Gill Action Fund, which is you know, part of a, a fundraising wing of the Gill Foundation to raise money for candidates. Um, Human Rights Campaign, 
Um, I think Empire State Pride Agenda, our state equality organization was there. Michael Bloomberg. All these people raised, and Bloomberg's a Republican, but whatever. Anyway, they raised, these gay organizations and funders did fundraisers for these four Republican uh, state assembly people. That I, it's not even two months passed, and I'm already right. Like you know, like there's something di- like a, something's moving in that in terms of those politics, and you know, I, I, so I to to sort of answer your question, I think that's the that's going to be the future of where this goes. Um, so I'll hear it and then hear it next. So, Go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think my biggest problem with the re- the rhetoric that gay is the new black is that it also implies that racism is over and that we don't, um, and that we've somehow moved into this colorblind society, which is another problem. But I see kind of, I, I have this like conceptual problem, I guess, within myself, because while I see the LGBT um, movement moving in sort of the same direction in, um, kind of claiming the, like, gay identity and then using a rights platform to kind of bring the movement into this um, sort of structure that mimics heterosexual society. Um, And I fear, like, that sort of disappearance. But I'm also concerned, I guess, as an activist, I want to know, like, what you think about the huge, like, disparity between, like, almost different factions of the movement because we have this sort of radical... Um, faction of the LGBT movement um, moving away from sort of grinding your gears within this like dysfunctional structure and then but there's still like parts of the country and I live um, in Texas as well and where everything there is just like there there is no even barely a liberal movement that um, and you still see like so many horrifying things happen so I'm just wondering how you deal with um, kind of parts of the nation being in so different, so many different places. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and what you just said about the kind of LGBT movement, kind of, it, it rhetorically suggests that like your ra- ra- we're post race and race is right. over. And that was part of my point, like kind of my side note of just some thinking. I'm thinking about kind of ways in which LGBT rights at the kind of international politics level is being used as a way to kind of litmus test towards liberal democracy, despite whatever, like Brazil, right? Brazil's passed all this, like, pro-LGBT legislation, and, I mean, the country is in full-on, like, I mean, the, the police just kill so many black people in the favelas that it's, like, un, it's, unima- it's, it's even unimaginable in the U.S. that that many people would be killed, like, by police, you know, even by comparison. Like, it's just unreal but they get to be seen as like oh and then they get to draw the, you know the world cup the all this stuff based on like being seen as this post race and now we have lgbt rights too kind of place when there's all this like racialized violence so right so just saying like to that point um to the question of um kind of what to do with the, the rest of the country i think that well there's a couple things I actually see a lot of them, the kind of more radical LGBT queer organizations, and I'm a part of a bunch of these conversations, so I can say with with a great level of certainty that um, there's a few things happening. I think, one, people are working in different kinds of coalitions with non not LGBT organizations. And what's, what's happened is, and I know this is true in actually in Texas. Uh, I know it's true in New Jersey. I can name other places where um, a lot of either racial justice, economic justice, civil rights organizations, whether they're doing immigration stuff, whether they're doing education, whatever the stuff that they're doing, you know, have been approached by some of the kind of more mainstream LGBT organizations. Oh, we want to work with you, whatever, whatever. And then they only get called and asked to be the black or brown face in a photo op or to sign on to say we're pro-marriage. But then when Katrina happens in New Orleans or when, you know, name something else, there's not a gay organization, none of those organizations are to be found, right, to say a word. When Troy Davis happened, not, not open their fucking mouths, right, about it. So, um, 
So a lot of organizations are like, we're done with them. <laughs> like, we don't play. It's like the, you know, and, and what they have found are the Al Goals in Texas, right? Or, you know, Southern Hills and New Ground in the South. Or, you know, Women with a Vision in Louisiana. Other organizations that are working in different coalitions around an issue that impacts LGBT folks, they're present at the table and can move their base and they can talk whether if it's a legislative campaign or that kind of policy piece about the specific kind of impact it has on LGBT people, but they're not working from like, this is about gay rights, right? Or this is about LGBT rights, specific, you know, like as a specific and separate kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's one of the weird things to me is like, it is in the moment, the last three years, when this economic crisis, everybody's talking economy, jobs, housing, blah, blah, the banks, whatever. And, you know, the gays are talking about getting up in a Vera Wang on any given <laughs> Sunday. You know, and I just, you know, and it just seems real. And it actually gives the right a lot of leeway to say, see, they're just a bunch of effete, wealthy people who don't, you know, who just want special rights. Everybody else is talking about, like, how am I going to eat and, and pay these student loans and jobs? And there's no, you know, so I see a lot of the more radical organizations working on the issues that they work on and finding like progressive or even trying to push even coalition partners that are like real iffy on the LGBT stuff really working over the long haul with folks to, to move some of that stuff right like song in, in Atlanta Southern was a new ground with a major player in the anti in the the challenge to the the you know kind of real draconian immigration law that Georgia passed similar to Arizona right um, so, you know, that folks are doing that, that sort of strategy. Yeah. I know that the gay community is still looking for rights within the realm of adoption. Have you done any work on, on that so far? No. Um, and I guess there's, you know, I guess I'm just going to sound like Debbie Downer today, Andy, but um, <laughs> I guess there's a, you know, there's a, there's a critique of that, right, that we find in the adoption. Um, bye, y'all. Um, <laughs> in the adoption um, conversation, um, like there's just no critique. It's just like the gays want their babies, right? And and they and like, I mean that's the way it, just, it feels like. And like and there's no critique of like why these black and brown kids end up in foster care to begin with, right? Or why all the kind of international conflicts like Vietnam and Korea you know, uh, or, you know, Haiti, you know, the earthquake, whatever, makes it possible that there's so many, you know, kind of, you know, kids in other countries that end up being, like, quote-unquote, available for adoption, right? And a, lot of, and a lot of real shaky stuff that happens in those places where kids could be taken by their aunts, uncles, whatever, and they're not allowed. I know that from people I know do stuff around in Vietnam around adoptions. So I think, you know, so the adoption thing is complicated, right? It's like, you know, yes, people should, you know, whatever. I don't think there should be laws to prevent LGBT people from being adopt from adopt from being able to adopt. But I think, but it, the conversation is just about like adoption becomes a way to just kind of assert my right to like kind of, you know, become like the sort of you know gay Donna Reeds, if you will. So and that and if you know, so then I can just adopt kids. I can, it, you know, it becomes about it's like property and it's like all the kind of you know, stuff around property and consumerism and not, and doesn't have a political critique of like how of like adoption happens and why, like it's problematic. So, um, so mostly what I do on that issue is say that much. <laughs> right? I don't do a whole lot of work. I don't do a lot of like advocacy around adoption. Well, let me, I will say this too. The other thing, what I, I have done and what QEJ does a lot is, um, you know, QEJ in part was, founded in large part in response because of the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, right? Which seems like, why would this queer organization pop up after welfare reform? Well, in New York City, um, you, different service providers, advocates, activists were finding like in their agencies that because of the, the new legislation that made women identify a biological father on a birth certificate and then gave states this money to do marriage promotion and all this other shit, people then it would lead you to believe that, oh, I'm obviously not supposed, like if they find out I'm a lesbian and my partner lives here in the house or whatever, they're going to take my kids away. And so the non-biological parent in these lesbian relationships where they were getting welfare or different kind of social, like um, welfare benefits, public assistance, 
the, the non-biological uh, parent of the children would go to the shelter system if they had nowhere to go, um, you know, and it's not that far off for like particularly black and Latino gay men often have their own biological children, not, it's less about adoption, right? So, you know, so I do some more work on that end of it about like people, you know, in mostly people of color communities who agree and mostly have kids of their own um, and, and kind of how they protect them versus like, ability right to adopt. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into it, but uh, as far as the international sort of spectrum thing goes, I mean, what do you suggest for making people look below the surface? Because I know, you know, South Africa has legal gay marriage, but at the same time, they also have the highest rates of correction rate. Right. Like, I, I mean, I feel like people just have this tendency to look at, oh, yay, you know, they legal gay marriage, it's awesome. But if you look below the surface, you know, it's not all that great. Like, I, I, how do you make people sort of pay more attention to that? I, you know, I, it, it actually, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, it just has to be, and even, I mean, the, the thing is, not always, it, it's sad to me to say that it's not just that people don't have the information, because I think even since when people have the information, they just don't care, right? They, they I mean, it's, it sounds real depressing or something to say, or maybe uh, cynical, but you know, when I tell people, I've, I've, I had a friend who went to this human rights campaign like event in D.C., and this was when the health care reform stuff was happening, and he was saying, he does a lot of HIV work, and he was saying to them, well, you know, 25% of the LGBT youth don't have any health care. A lot of trans people don't have it at all because they can just be kicked off just for being, you know, transgender or whatever, or be denied coverage for whatever. And they, they like, people like, we don't care. Like, they care about marriage. So, I, you know what I mean? So, like, uh, unfortunately, that's just true for some folks. I think that um, otherwise, um, it just takes some paying attention to. Like, um, I, I would have to say for me, I, I guess I'm just a nerd. And, you know, <laughs> pay attention to um, kind of politics of places, regions that I'm, I have various kinds of interest in. And, and try to build relationships with people in those places, right? So, um, you know, so I have friends in South Africa. Um, you know, I have friends in other, you know, places. Um, I just came back from Dominican Republic yesterday, my first time in the, in the Caribbean, and, uh, you know, have a lot of thoughts about, you know, just whatever. I'm just, you know, just thinking about um, those type of things. So, yes, I mean, I pay attention to news that happens in other countries. <laughs> I think it's part of it. Like, I mean, you just get to kind of be exposed to I don't just watch CNN. Like, I you know, you know, look through uh, allafrica.com, which kind of is like a news tracker for all these Af sub-Saharan African newspapers. Um, I go through that periodically. And not just about gay stuff, you know. It's like, I'm just gay for a living. <laughs> you know, I look at a range of other stuff that's how you know, the economy, what's how you know, prison and stuff. I look at a range of different things. Um, so I just think it just takes a certain kind of curiosity to go beyond, like, what people tell you is the truth, right? Like, um, and maybe I'm just hard-headed and never believe what people tell me anyway. So, <laughs> you know, so that's just my tendency. Um, so, just, I mean, it requires some scratching the surface, right, and going beyond. What you, and not, so, in that, so both of that about South Africa and also that not every, you know, like right now, in, I have some, a friend in Nigeria, a couple of one in particular who does LGBT youth work in Nigeria, and they're doing, like, a, a young lesbian, like, survey of, of young, under 24 lesbian Nigerians in eastern Nigeria, right? And most Americans' conception of what Africa is like for LGBT, you know, like, it's again, it's the site of just, like, violence and, and horror and whatever, right? And civil war, all the range of things that people just kind of place as, you know, kind of in Africa. And, like, some of those things are true or just in things that have happened, but, you know, count on whenever there's something, there's also other, some, other stuff going on. Um, and, and right now, I know, you know, just from looking at, like, some of the Nigerian papers, like, my friend always sends me these stories, it's, like, a real kind of, like, the tabloids are really interested in kind of finding out which, like, celebrities are on the DL in Nigeria or gay or whatever. I mean, it's all this sort of, so that, that even in its kind of homophobia suggests some, that there's this captive interest, you know, that, that something is being, is shaking up there, right, or that something is, that there are other things going on beyond, that there's conversations happening.